Welcome back to Newswire. We've got Sam McQuillan with us from Legal Sports Report. We've got some earnings reports to talk about, specifically FanDuel. We'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, let's start off with Sam, bringing him back on the show here, second time this week. Sam, thanks for coming on. Let's dive into uh, the very latest. You've had now some time to unpack this story uh, about DraftKings, where a couple of weeks ago they come out and they say, hey, look, uh, if you win money with us, we're going to take a very small piece of your pie, and you won't even notice it. That got a lot of backlash, social media, everywhere else. They decide to pull the plug on that, making that announcement uh, a couple of days ago, Sam. And, you know, obviously you're reporting on this stuff, but you also have an opinion clearly on this. Why do you think DraftKings decided to go from one extreme to the other here? Yeah, Craig, it's been an eventful last couple of days since DraftKings first announced the surcharge, which really caught a lot of people off guard. It was going to come to states like New York and Illinois, Pennsylvania uh, that have high taxes on sports betting. So they've talked for a while about, you know, passing this down to the better in some way. No one thought it was going to be an actual fee that shows up on your bet slip. A lot of people thought, hey, maybe they could just make the odds worse. So I think that's one of the most interesting parts here is why they chose to do this whole announcement. And then a few days later, they decide, hey, just kidding. We're not going to go through with it. Now, that announcement actually came a couple hours after FanDuel said that they would not be considering uh, such a fee, which a lot of people had speculated. Maybe if FanDuel does it and DraftKings do it, you'll have the two biggest players in the market kind of leading the way, and it won't impact DraftKings as much. But with FanDuel saying we won't do it, that left DraftKings pretty much on an island, um, and they came out two hours later and said we're not going to have it. So if I had enough space right now in my home studio to take a victory lap, I would. You know, I predicted that FanDuel wouldn't do this. Why would they? Uh, they really had no reason to. They've been weathering the storm in high tax states, just like DraftKings has. So really interesting to see them come out and say, hey, we're not going to end up doing it. Now we have some fallout from that. How is that going to affect their business going forward? They had projected that they would lose about $50 million uh, just in the next four months from Illinois raising its tax alone. So does that mean they're going to lose $150 million from Illinois next year? Um, what, how are their investors going to react to that news that they won't be making up this money in that way? Then are you going to have the, the fee being passed down to the betters just in a different form? Is it going to be right. worse odds like we've talked about in the past? And quite frankly, I'm wondering why that, hasn't, why that wasn't the case to begin with. Maybe that means it's too hard for them to do. Maybe that means it's completely off the table. So there's a lot of burning questions kind of in the wake of DraftKings rescinding its announcement. Now, the stock is back up a little bit today uh, to about $33 a share. It dropped 18% after the news that they would add the surcharge uh, just two weeks ago. So it was a big impact on the stock market. Some people were thinking maybe they were just testing the waters, but why test the waters if you know the stock is going to react so much? So DraftKings, different than one of those companies like Caesars, different than Flutter, which owns FanDuel even. And really, they are beholden to their investors. There's a lot of pressure to show a profit, especially because the U.S. and online sports betting and iGaming are really their only operations. They don't have other sectors of the business they can lean on as much like these other companies. So I think it's really interesting that they decided to get a, uh, do away with this thing. But now it's going to be even more interesting to see what happens as a result um, in these states, whether it's betters, whether it's investors. It really impacts a lot of people. Yeah, and you're right, Sam. It's, it's you know, to me, instead of taking or announcing that you're going to take some winnings, I mean, you could just go from minus 110 on all bets to minus 112, you know? Like, I, I understand that that's noticeable, just like taking the money out of people's winnings, but it's not unheard of on a lot of these books to have different odds. And if that's what you're after, especially from novice people, I, I mean, it seems to me that would have been the smarter thing to do. And not that I'm endorsing that, but I, I very odd operation, I would say, an announcement and everything else from them. I think we can agree on that. All right, uh, let's get to FanDuel. Let's talk about FanDuel. Uh, they have some announcements coming. I know you guys wrote about this over at Legal Sports Report that their growth numbers are in as far as this latest quarter. What did they report? Yeah, so aside from the news that FanDuel wouldn't be adding the fee, there were some really big takeaways from Flutter's earnings call. They reported 47% of the total U.S. online sports betting market and 41% of the total U.S. Uh, iGaming market, which great numbers for FanDuel. It continues to be in the number one spot. They had about $1.5 billion of revenue in the U.S. versus DraftKings, which had about 1.1. So ahead of them there and about 3.4 average monthly users on FanDuel versus 3.1 uh, for DraftKings. So uh, CEO, the CEO of uh, Flutter, uh, Peter Jackson, talked about 
their ability to add more customers, but then at the same time, get even more revenue from those customers. Their customer or acquisition was up about 30% in the quarter, but revenue was up about 41%, which they attributed to a number of benefits from product enhancements, product changes. These are things like uh, having more people placing bets on the NBA that are live bets as opposed to pre-match bets. They had about a 4% increase in a uh, handle that was live as opposed to pre-match. And that's important given the fact that uh, live betting is a lot more profitable for sports books. They have a higher hold rate generally, which is why you've seen companies like FanDuel, companies like DraftKings try to push live betting more and more lately, whether that's in promos that they're giving out to people, whether that's in investments they're making in the product with companies like Sport Radar, which have really touted their live betting capabilities. Uh, parlays in uh, the MLB were also up about 8.4% uh, year over year, which is a huge increase um, from last year. You know, if you know anything about the sports betting industry, parlays are really where they are making their money on these high holds that we're seeing compared to back in the day when, you know, about 6% hold in Vegas would be really good. Now companies like DraftKings FanDuel are getting, you know, 10 to 12% just from people betting these, basically these lottery tickets, these, you know, $5 bets that would be, you know, $300, $400, something like that. So that was up. And WNBA betting as well was up about 400% from last year. Obviously, WNBA has been a lot more popular, but the, uh, FanDuel also made a lot of significant investments um, in its WNBA product. It's one of the two partners with the WNBA. So more to come on those fronts as well. I'd imagine, you know, they're just going to roll their winnings over and keep betting on product changes, product enhancements as they continue to grow their customers. So really good quarter for FanDuel. And obviously, um, you know, with the surcharge news as well, they're, they're riding high right now. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And and again, they got out front and said we weren't going to employ this uh, surcharge. And I, and I think maybe FanDuel looked more positive upon for that. Okay, Nebraska sports bettors have to go in person to make bets, but I know that they've been pushing to get this online for a number of months. How much closer do you think, Sam, that this is getting? Yeah, it, it's getting closer from the standpoint that there's a lot of support behind it happening. The problem here is... So much support is needed for this to happen and more importantly needed for it to happen anytime soon. A com Senate committee in Nebraska advanced a bill this week that um, if it gets to the Senate floor, the Senate votes on it, it'll essentially allow voters to vote on the ballot if they want sports betting. But everything else is what happens after that. They need about 80 percent of the full Senate vote for this to pass. If they don't get it, they need 60% um, for it to pass in 2026. So a lot of support is really needed here because of the nature of changing a gaming law in a state like Nebraska is really difficult. If this does get to the ballot, uh, people would have to overwhelmingly approve it. And then lawmakers would then come back in January 2025 to then figure out how sports betting is all going to work, what the mm -hmm. legal framework would look like. So there's a ton of steps, a ton of you have to approve this for us to approve that for us to approve this. So it's still pretty far away in Nebraska. You only have four casinos you can place bets at right now, but things are progressing in a good direction. It's just going to be a very, very slow direction uh, if you're in Nebraska and you want online sports betting. So uh, it'll be something we monitor for the rest of the year as it uh, continues to unfold. All right, Sam. Well, thanks once again for coming on the show a couple times this week. We'll catch up with you next week here on Newswire. Yep. Thanks, Greg.